Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Certification Licensure in Wisconsin. Uh, my name is Mark Kirstein. and I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Chapter. This is being taped for posterity purposes. Hope everybody dressed up nicely today. <clears throat> uh, before I get started with certification, I'm just going to say a few words about NASW membership, which hopefully every one of you will join while you're here. It's only $48 as a student, and it provides many benefits to students and also the professionals. It's basically your professional association throughout your career. We have the most robust job listing service in the state. Uh, we send out over 100 jobs uh, a week uh, to subscribing members for free. We have a mentor contact program. Uh, and as a professional, there are um, well, also, once you graduate, you have a, a three-year transition as an MSW student and two-year transition as a BSW student before you get to the full rate. And there's many um, purposes uh, as a professional to um, be a member. We have the most affordable malpractice insurance, which if you're clinical, you have to have. Um, we also provide ethical and legal support, and social workers do some of the most challenging work in society. We are advocates for our clients, whether it be um, you know, getting better services and even within our agency, and we have standards there. So I get calls all the time from uh, social worker members who have challenging situations. I walk through them, I make legal referrals. Our national office has, has attorneys that help people out with legal situations and lots of documentation there. We also have a mentor contact program for if you're interested in a particular area of practice, you can get the list and contact anybody on the list. It's also an opportunity to, um, as an ASW member, to meet colleagues and make contacts. Starting as a student, uh, it, it, it looks good in your resume, but it's, you, can, you can also connect with professionals. And I can set you up with some of these people who can kind of help you get started and learn the lay of the land in your, <clears throat> in your work. Um, a few other, couple other things I want to mention before I get started. Um, some of you may have reacted not so positively to the results on Tuesday. Uh, whatever your position is, uh, we do have a lobby day every two years. Um, we have one coming up on April 15th. Uh, we will be doing a number of issues that will affect you directly. Uh, one is the higher education lower debt bill that would that would save you guys hundreds of dollars of years on your on your loans. Another one is the social work safety bill, which would help protect the safety your safety while you're making home visits. Uh, and there'll be other items as well. So mark that in your calendar, April fifteenth. Just walk straight up State Street. Um, the lobbying will be done at the Capitol. We will have a training two blocks from the Capitol. We'll train you on all the issues, and there'll be more information will be coming. So uh, let me uh, start with talking about certification and licensure. So in Wisconsin, um, certification means title protection. You cannot use the title social worker, um, pr present yourself as a social worker um, unless you are certified. So it's basically title protection. And you can't call yourself a clinical social worker, advanced practice social worker. Now, licensure we have only for the clinical level, and, and licensure basically uh, means you cannot practice in this particular area, and that's specifically to clinical social work. So you cannot do psychotherapy unless you are licensed in one of the areas which allow psychotherapy, one of which is clinical social work. So that's the difference between certification and licensure. Wisconsin regulates or certifies all the way from the bachelor's level up to through the master's uh, level. Uh, clinical is the only one that's actually licensed. Wisconsin has four levels of certification. The certified social worker, certified advanced practice social worker, certified independent social worker, and licensed clinical social worker. The certified social worker is for people who have a bachelor's degree in social work from an accredited program. These are the initials that you would put after your name after you would become uh, certified. Certified advanced practice social worker, that's for individuals with a master's degree in social work from an accredited program. 
And then these are the two advanced levels. Certified independent social worker, and I have that category, are people who, um, okay, people who have two years of post-master's uh, training, not clinical. And then the licensed clinical social worker, <clears throat> I'll go into a lot more depth on that. That's two years of post-master's clinical practice plus certain things during your graduate studies. Um, the certified independent social worker is pretty archaic. Uh, there is, um, I've never seen a job listing that requires that particular category. Uh, so uh, I will talk about advancing from one to the other. Um, most of the people in this category are people like myself who were grandfathered in. So a certified social worker, it says master's or bachelor's, but it's essentially for people with a bachelor's degree. And one of the important considerations here is if some of you are a CSW or will become a CSW, you cannot do psychotherapy unless you upgrade your certification. Even if you graduated with your master's degree in social work, uh, you still cannot do psychotherapy unless you're at least a CAPSW. So that's something that's important to know. Certified Advanced Practice Social Worker, for those of you that uh, are in the MSW program, that's the one that you would apply for. A CAPSW can do psychotherapy under supervision, and we'll talk about what kind of supervision. A certified independent social worker, um, which is what I am, th completed 3,000 hours of postgraduate full-time uh, certified. They may engage in, in psychotherapy under supervision. Uh, so if you want to upgrade from a CAPSW to a CISW, you would need to be supervised by either an LCSW or a CISW. All right, licensed clinical social worker, and I'll spend a little more time on this because this is much more complex. <clears throat> so a licensed clinical social worker, uh, obviously you have a master's degree, a PhD in social work with a clinical social work concentration, which I will explain receive clinical field training and complete a supervised practice that's licensed, um, they may engage in psychotherapy without supervision. Now the next slides are going to explain these. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I need to repeat them so it gets on camera. Uh, if you can hold them to the end, that's great, but if you need to ask them in, during the time, that's fine, but I will repeat the question. So these are the requirements for an LCSW. <clears throat> you obviously need an MSW. Um, you have to um, get your CAPSW before you can accrue even one hour towards your 3,000 hours. <clears throat> In um, graduate school, if you, want to be, if you want to be a licensed clinical social worker, you must complete a class in psychopathology and social work and two cl additional clinical classes. Uh, you need uh, 3,000 hours of supervised clinical practice, inc including 1,000 hours in direct client contact, and I'll explain more about this. <clears throat> the supervision does not necessarily need to be your employment supervisor. So if you are in a setting and your direct supervisor is, <clears throat> say, a nurse or a business major or something like that, uh, that would not count for the clinical supervision, you would need to make arrangements with somebody else for your clinical super, supervision. <clears throat> you also need a clinical field placement in graduate school. <clears throat> so the um, social work section, um, Wisconsin is a very strict state in terms of becoming clinical, one of the strictest states in the country. Now, I'm going to give you the logic of it, then I'll tell you um, the requirements. Anybody that becomes a licensed clinical social worker can the very next day uh, open up their own private practice without supervision, say even out of their own home. So the, the social work section does not want to give anybody this license to practice unless they're convinced that they've had the requisite experience and training uh, that's part of this 
<coughs> uh, law. So they, um, the LCSW is, is, can be considered a psychotherapeutic licensed. And in order to, the 3,000 hours needs to be in doing psychotherapy, DSM diagnosis and psychotherapeutic treatment. Now, there are some settings that are easier to uh, document this than others, but it doesn't mean that if you're in a less traditional setting, you can't succeed in getting licensed. But you need to keep in mind <coughs> what the requirements are. Um, you need to be get, gathering experience in doing diagnosis, DSM diagnosis, hopefully with a variety of different clients. And it can't just be AODA. It's got to be a variety of different clients. <clears throat> and then you need to have experience doing treatment, psychotherapeutic treatment, for those of you doing that. So what that means is case management does not count. So if you get a job just doing case management, that's not going to count for clinical. <clears throat> you, really, you need to do the diagnosis and you need to do the treatment. These are some examples of settings, outpatient mental health clinics, inpatient psychiatric hospitals, treatment facilities, intensive home facilities. These are not the only ones that can count. Um, if you are in a less traditional setting, you probably should check with me or check with the department. You have to be a member and check with me, by the way, but, and we can discuss this. <clears throat> now, the department is trying to pressure the social work section to ease these requirements, but the section's not willing to do that, uh, and we'll see what happens. But I'm telling you what the requirements are right now. Supervision can be by an LCSW psychologist or psychiatrist. If you want another supervisor, you need to get advanced permission, which they may not grant. <clears throat> the social work section has always preferred that people be supervised if possible by a social worker, but they will allow psychologists and psychiatrists as written into the law. So that's something you have to also keep in mind. Supervision should average one hour per week over the course of supervision. Uh, could be more in the beginning, less in the end. And group supervision, up to six individuals is allowed. Now these are other various aspects of certification and licensure uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, you are uh, a required reporter to report child abuse and neglect as a certified licensed social worker. You can receive a temporary certificate up to nine months uh, if you're waiting to take the national exam, but you will need to have graduated here. Let's say you have a wait. Uh, clinical social workers in the state of Wisconsin are required to have malpractice insurance. One, one million for incident, three million altogether. <clears throat> there are agencies that will cover that. Uh, we always recommend that you have your own because we say they'll cover themselves first and you second. But legally, um, you just need to have it. There is a continuing education requirement. Uh, every, you need uh, <clears throat> 30 hours uh, every two years, including four hours of ethics and boundaries. During the, uh, the two-year period that you become certified for the first time, it's not prorated. You don't need to worry about it. And I'll just I'll illustrate that. So. If some of you graduate, let's say you graduate this May, for instance, or get licensed by June or July, um, that credentialing period ha uh, began March 1 and it will end February 28th of 2017. So all the credentialing periods go odd to odd year, March 1 to February 28th. So any time during that <clears throat> March 1 to February 28th two-year period, you become certified or licensed, you're cool for that period and you need to start worrying about it March 1st of the next period. So if you got certified or licensed, say, July or August of 2015, you're not going to have to start worrying about doing continuing education 
until March 1, 2017. And then by February 28th of 2019, you need to have completed your 30 hours of continuing education, including four hours of ethics. Uh, now, we, one, another reason that people do join NSW is we have uh, give major discounts to members and continue education. Another part of certification and licensure is privileged communication. Now, you don't have to be certified if your job title is not social worker, but I tell anybody who's doing direct service they really should be certified to protect the confidentiality to the very least to protect the confidentiality of the records of the clients because you, their clients' records are privileged if you are, certif if you are certified. <clears throat> if some attorney uh, tr or police officer tries to bully you to get the records, and that happens often, you can just, you can just say, hey, the records are privileged. You're going to have to go to court and get a court order. And then, of course, and if that does happen, we have people subpoenaed. Uh, you can contact our office or the national office about that, about how to handle that. <clears throat> but certification does protect the confidentiality of the, of the records. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of psychometric testing. Uh, there is certain tests that you can automatically do as a clinical social worker or even a, cert a certified advanced practice social worker. There's other kinds of tests that you're going to need to be supervised or, or be uh, given permission by someone who's credentialed and experienced in that area. So this information um, is, in, is in here and you can read it over. Um, but this also lists the kind of testing that you don't need to be uh, certified to get. <clears throat> but to do what they consider psychometric testing, um, you need approval needed by the social work section that you've met certain qual qualifications, you have a letter from a supervisor. So that's listed uh, in the rules here. MPSW 20 is a conduct code for certified licensed social workers. You should carefully review that. Uh, this is what you're held responsible for as a certified licensed social worker. The one area I want to bring to your attention is record keeping, which is a little more extensive than the other areas. <clears throat> Basically, it's unprofessional conduct of failing to maintain adequate records. They should be prepared in a timely fashion. This, look, this describes what needs to be maintained in that. Absent exceptional circumstances, clinical records shall be prepared no more than one week following client contact, and a discharge summary shall be prepared promptly upon closure. Clinical records shall be maintained for at least seven years after the last service. Now, NESW's uh, insurance company would say never throw them out because you never know when someone could sue you. But l according to the conduct code, you need to keep them for seven years. Other aspects, uh, if you are moving from one category to the other, say you're a certified social worker and you're moving to certified advanced practice social worker, or you're a certified advanced practice social worker and moving to a LCSW, um, you don't need to retake the state exam, which I'll explain later, as long as it's within five years. Now. It, there, sometimes people go in through their master's program and they're interested in one topic and they're not really interested in doing becoming a, cl a clinical social worker and then perhaps later on they change their mind. So we got the law changed to provide a way of handling that. If you um, go through a master's degree and you do not do a clinical concentration or a field placement, you can do something afterwards to accommodate that. You can there's three courses that you need to take, and you can take those post-masters, the psychopathology and social work, and the two additional clinical classes. And you can do an extra 1,500 hours, of which 500 has to be a direct client contact, so that you would do, instead of 3,000 hours, you'd do 4,500 hours. And instead of 1,000 hours of direct client contact, you'd do 1,500. Reimbursement. <clears throat> Uh, this is a big issue that uh, comes up. Uh, we got through NESW, we are able to get some changes in reimbursement to make it 
easier for people like you to get work afterwards who are doing, who are wanting to become licensed clinical social workers. <clears throat> so number one, the rules were changed for state regulated outpatient clinics so that insurance companies are now required to reimburse certified advanced practice social workers working at clinics. Now, if you are, um, so you've graduated and you're looking to find a placement to get your 3,000 hours, uh, we do have a booklet for members uh, that we can send out, or it's, uh, it's online. The list agencies that have indicated in the past that they have hired people for 3,000 hours or be willing to do so in the future. In addition, if you have a contact with a state certified clinic, you could let them know, hey, by the way, did you know that I, because I'm a CAPSW, you can get reimbursed for me through an insurance company and also through providing services to medical assistance clients. So we lobbied for these items for a long time and they are in place now. So this is something that can help um, <coughs> social workers, uh, advanced practice social workers get, get work. Uh, LCSWs, um, because we got what's called the vendorship bill through, their uh, insurance companies are required to directly reimburse LCSWs who are providing psychotherapy. Before this time they weren't, you had to work in these state, rated, state clinics and it was costly and um, overbearing, shall we say. Uh, we got our vendorship bill through, NASW did, and now licensed clinical social workers can work independently and get reimbursed and set up your shingles then anywhere. <clears throat> they also will, the Department of Health Services will also reimburse licensed clinical social workers uh, independently for providing services to MA clients. So these are, um, aspects of how you can get reimbursement as an independent practitioner. With certification licensure, you know, we have the code of conduct. Uh, agencies that terminate employees, or in cases where an employee quits and they would have been terminated, or there's some discipline for cause, they're supposed to report people to the Department of Safety and Professional Services. Not everybody knows this. <coughs> And I want to make the point that um, if you someday get reported, it doesn't mean that your career is over. Just because someone's reported doesn't mean that any action will be taken. What happens if someone is reported, and sometimes you have a disgruntled client, <clears throat> you know, sometimes it might be a custody situation. Uh, what happens if someone gets reported to the Department of State of Professional Services, they will contact the person who is been reported and asked for their side of the story, and then the social work section uh, will, at their next meeting, they, they have a subgroup that meets and look at the cases, and they throw out a lot of cases. So just because you get reported doesn't mean you need to, that means anything's going to happen. <clears throat> but agencies are required to report, so if someday you become an executive director or a manager and you fire a, a certified or licensed social worker because of misconduct, you need to report that. And this talks about when it's required, when they terminate, suspend, or restrict the employment or contract as a result of uh, disciplinary action related to the credential, acts of negligence, misconduct. And if someone <coughs> is, resigns, which often happens, you know, the, the uh, supervisor will point out and they're about to fire someone because they did something really bad. Um, they may resign, they still have to report them. And this is who you report them to. Uh, this is where to apply. Now, you all live in Madison, so you can do all this online. You can also go down to the Department of Safety and Prof Professional Services, which is about a mile from the Capitol on the east side, and pick up stuff there, and that's our phone number. <coughs> uh, these are the fees. The total fee uh, for not including the national exam, but the total fee is $165. So you need to kind of keep that in mind. You know, start planning that. The state exam. So there's two exams that you would take uh, for certification, initial certification. One is a state exam. That's, that's an exam on laws and rules affecting the practice 
of, of social workers, marriage family therapists, special counselors. Uh, this is an online open book test. Uh, the, uh, all the information, the information is taken from uh, the code book, which is found online. You can look at it now. It's on the Department of Safety and Professional Services website. Uh, you, if you want, you can purchase the booklet. If it's easier for you to do in your hand, in your hand, it's maybe $20, $25. Passing grade is 85%. The exam is untimed. You can X and return any time over a three-month period. Uh, and this, um, this particular slide shows the areas that the information of the exam is taken from. So it's probably a good idea before you take the state exam just to look over these statutes to get an idea. So it won't take you quite as long to finish the exam. Now you take the exam um, after your application is submitted and you receive your password and 10 digit ID. So you submit your application first with all the money, with the, you know, the money that you have, and then you uh, can take the exam. Now, here's where the big costs come in. Uh, the national exam is not cheap. It's $230. We actually protested the, the fee increase um, to no avail. We thought it was rather excessive. Uh, this is, we actually go to a test site. Uh, there are various testing sites throughout Wisconsin. Uh, it'll take three and a half hours. Uh, if you don't pass it, you have 90 days you have to wait 90 days before you can uh, repeat it. After all your examination application materials are received, then you can take the exam, the national exam. Uh, NASW does have an exam preparation course. We have one as a form of a webinar, and we have one in, in person. Our in-person is always done in Milwaukee, and then we have the webinar course. So that's something you could use if you like. Uh, there's also, there are, very expensive booklets you can, for for-profit companies that are advertised in the NSW News, I don't necessarily recommend you do that. You can, but I cannot vouch for any of the groups. But there are um, you know, various ways of studying for this. You should, at the bare minimum, purchase the ASWB booklet for $30. That ASWB, Association for Social Work Boards, that's the uh, group that administers the exams. It's out of the uh, East Coast. So you can get in order the $30 booklet for your particular exam. And I mentioned that we do have exam preparation workshops. Um, other information on exam, you can take the exams within six months of graduation. Now, the rule's gonna change that there won't be a restriction on that. <clears throat> I, however, I do not think that most people would, would take it before that time. But just, Understand that you can take the exam before you graduate. And if you have the time and energy to do so, I would recommend it. Because once you pass the exam, as you're interviewing for jobs, you can tell the employer, I've passed the exam. Only thing left is for the UW to verify my um, graduation. And then, then there's no problem. In order to take the exams early, there's an academic verification form that needs to be filled out by the school. And you will be contacting ASWB to register for the national exam. <clears throat> You'll get a form in the mail to when, you're at, when you can contact them. These are the names of the ASW exams. Um, so those of you that are taking, well, this, for the bachelor's, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's ASWB bachelor's examination. But those who are taking for the CAPSW, you want to know you're taking the ASWB master's examination. And then the clinical is the clinical one. So that's a little thing you should keep in mind so you register for the correct exam, right? If you want to spend $220 and do the wrong exam, that would not be fun. Substance abuse counseling. Now this is probably going to change, so I'm kind of tell you what it is right now. There are um, restrictions on the practice of substance abuse uh, in Wisconsin. 
And if you want to call yourself a specialist in substance abuse, or right now if you're doing people with dependency, and this is going to change because the new DSM doesn't even distinguish between dependency and abuse. Um, but right now, um, it's not enough to be a certified or licensed social worker to, do, to call yourself a specialist or to work with clients that are dependent rather than abusing drugs. You need to do one of two things. You could get a specialty classification <clears throat> through um, the social worker section. It's a little easier to get, a little cheaper. You still have to pass the ICRC exam, which is an exam that really <coughs> passes to be certified uh, as a substance abuse counselor. You'll need 1,000 hours of face-to-face -face counseling experience with substance use disorder clients and 180 hours of AODA special education. Now, some of this is going to change over the next year. And it's another reason to be a member of NESW because we'll you know, form people as it changes. I, I know that it's going to change because the last examining board meeting, they're presenting a proposal that they're looking at to make some changes to it, to make it a little bit easier particularly for those people who have a master's degree. Now, if you're getting the straight substance abuse counseling certification, which doesn't re actually require any degree at all, which I can talk about that, but maybe I won't <laughs> right now. Um, you pass the ICRC exam. You need 360 hours of education, 4,000 hours of supervised practice, um, they do give some credit for having a bachelor's in social work or a master's in social work um, with addiction emphasis, 1,000 hours for a BSW, $2,000 for MSW. Now, you can do some treatment without the certification or specialty classification. Whoops. So what that is is that if you are working with a client and say you don't have the classification, and you realize the client it does have a dependency issue, but they're not willing or ready to be referred out yet. You can continue to work with them until they're ready to be go into treatment or be referred out. Secondly, if somebody has been through treatment, you can work with them to prevent relapse. So those are kind of the exceptions to you can't work with people with uh, the dependency. Criminal offenses. Wisconsin law basically says, and there's been attempts to change it, and we fight this all the time, but that they can't discriminate against somebody um, unless the offense is substantially related to the practice that they're taking, that, that, the, to, the, to the job position. And that's the same thing with social work practice. Uh, if you've had an offense in the past, unless it's substantially related to social work practice, uh, you don't need to worry that it's going to ruin your career. They may ask individuals to appear in person to explain the circumstances of their conviction and discuss the person's development. I've seen this happen at some hearings where they do um, ask um, someone to explain that. But it, just because you've done something, I mean, people do dumb things in their young years, it doesn't mean you're never going to be able to be a social worker. Reciprocity. Uh, this probably doesn't apply to all of you that much, but it applies to people coming in. Um, I tell people just don't apply through reciprocity because the, the way that the state works is that unless their state law is exactly the same as ours, they don't, they don't consider it reciprocal, and you, bas you basically have to go through the same application as anybody else. You will not have to retake the national exam, however, if you've, if you've taken the appropriate one. Continue education. Uh, basic requirements, 30 hours every two years, four hours of professional boundaries and ethics in related to social work. Ethics must be in an interactive format. Certificate holders must keep records of continuing education for four years, so you must keep records of that. They do audit. About 10% of people are audited. Uh, you cannot carry your hours over to the next credentialing period. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, there's no continuing education requirement during the time period between receiving the initial credential 
and the commencement of the full two-year period. And this talks about the credentialing period. Our current period is going to end February 28th, 2015. What programs are acceptable? <clears throat> um, programs relevant to the professional practice of social work. Um, and starting March 1, 2015, with a few exceptions, programs must be pre-approved and will be one of the approval bodies. So you will need to be more careful um, well, when you become certified and when the period starts that you have to start worrying about it, you'll need to know this information because it has to be pre-approved. Exceptions include programs offered by a credit university. In-house training up to 15 hours it does not have to be pre-approved, but after that it does. Questions? Yeah. Um, if you're thinking of taking the national exam before you graduate, mm -hmm. when do you recommend taking the state exam? Well, you would take the state exam before. How much more does it matter? I think they require you to take the state exam first, and then you take the national after that. And does it take a while, I mean, to get the results to them? Uh, the, the, well, the national exam, you get your results immediately. Uh, the state exam. It's an open book. It's open book, yeah. So you'd know that pretty soon. Oh. Other, other, yeah. So if you take the national exam, this is probably the obvious, but if you move to a different state, any state, you don't have to retake the national one, just the state one? Right. Um, so the question is uh, if you take the national exam in one state, do you have to retake the national exam? Another state? I've never seen an, another state that would require that. Um, there was one state, California, that had their own exam, but I understand that they're switching over to the, the ASWB's exam. Now, state exams, uh, not every state requires a state exam. But obviously, if they do require a state exam, you're going to have to take that exam with that other state because the state exam refers to the laws in that state. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the practice of paying for supervision if you are working for an employer who doesn't offer that? I've heard of people paying for um, other LCSWs to provide supervision so that they can still work towards that. Recovery. Yeah, it's 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 allowed. You can you can pay for uh, for someone else, make arrangements with someone else to supervise you. It should average. If you're working full time, it should average one hour a week. It's the same requirements. Um, but you're doing somebody who's not your employment supervisor, so you're paying, making arrangements with somebody else um, outside the agency to do that. Would you say that's fairly common that people need to do that, pay their own, pay for? Uh, it's, I wouldn't say. I think it's more common that people have someone at their own agency that will do it, okay. but some people do have to do that. Okay. Um, yeah. The academic verification form mm -hmm. does that need to be signed by an advisor before we um, submit? our app to take the state exam or do we do that academic verification form after the state exam is passed and then before we now do to the take the ex well what they've what they've required up to now is to take <clears throat> um, and this is going to change but up to now they've requ they wanted to make sure you're six months away from graduation so there's a form that the schools has to fill out to show that you're in good standing and you're six months away and then, and then, then you're allowed to take uh, the state exam. Okay. I have actually that information is in this handout. So if you want to just pass that around. If you're right, the academic verification mm -hmm. form would come to one of the two advisors, Mary or myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to be signed by Jen Greenberg. So mm -hmm. what we do is we verify that you don't have any incompletes, no grades pending. And assuming you will graduate in May, we give it to Jan, he signs it, and then we send it off right. to them. Okay. And how long does that take until we then get the okay to take the state exam? I don't know. That See, since it's a paper form and it's mail, then it's really yeah. up to whoever there to open it and right. put it into the system. That, yeah, right. And we can't have it signed by you and mailed until that six-month mark? No, you give this to us after your grades are posted mm -hmm. in, at the end of December, so we'll get those some of those in January, February, and March, and we submit it. Usually it takes about a week. It depends on when Jan is able to sign them. Okay, because my question would be, the earliest we could have it signed would maybe be November, so we could then take 
some of the exams over winter break? No, you no. can't. You need grades posted. Okay. We need to see grades posted mm -hmm. for the fall. Okay, let's go on over here. Okay. So after you get your master's in social work, right. and the part about you're not supposed to say you're a social worker, can you say, I have a master's in social yes. work? But you're not allowed yes. to literally say, I am a social worker. Exactly. You got it. It doesn't make much sense, does it? But that's the law. Yeah, go ahead. So mm. I've been kind of like mm. looking at different job mm. postings mm. and have noticed that a lot of jobs require LCSW even if they don't do psychopathology. Can you explain if some employers maybe think that it's a licensed social worker is like the standard? Or like how do you approach that? That's a definite problem. <clears throat> and there are, in fact, about a year or two ago, I wrote up a little fact sheet for this on behalf of the school, uh, and, but I posted on our website about what the difference is between LCSW and a CAPSW. <clears throat> and I pointed out that the only reason that an employer would need someone with an LCSW is if that person was going to supervise people going for their LCSW or that person was going to do psychotherapy uh, diagnosis. Otherwise, there's no reason to do that. You can supervise and do employment supervision, you can provide any other kind of social work, that's the only reason. There are employers that require that, who don't need to, and I've heard that around the state, and there needs to be some education of them, because that's um, not a good thing on their part, because they may be losing somebody who's a lot more qualified for the job, they just don't have the LCSW. So how would you approach that, like with an employer, where that's like a qualification, would you still apply? Hmm. That, I mean, if you don't have it, they're gonna, they may just throw it out, but if you can informally talk with them or, um, I mean, if they had any questions, I'd be happy to talk to them okay. and explain that, explain that to them, that, uh, as would the school, because the, the, there are a lot of us that are concerned about exactly what you're talking about. It's not just in Madison, Milwaukee has the same thing and probably other parts around the state that some employers, not all, but some employers just say LCSW because they think it's the highest level, but, but it's actually, it's a psychotherapeutic kind of credential. Mm -hmm. And if they're not going to do psychotherapy, why do you need it? Um, now, if it's a mental health complex, I can understand that, but if it's just somebody in a hospital doing discharge planning, you know, unless there's some need for that kind of psychotherapeutic mental health training, then you can understand it, but otherwise it's not needed. Yeah. So after you take the state exam, is there a time limit for when you need to take the national exam? A time limit to take the national exam after you take this, I mean, most people would do that right, right away. Uh, I'm not sure there is a time limit per se on that. I know that if you, um, to go from, there's a five year limit on the state exam that uh, it, it's no longer valid. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you wait five years, they might make, make you retake the state exam. But mo I mean, most people are gonna take it within a year, within a few months of each other, because your point is to get certified, licensed. Yeah. Once you take the state exam, is that good for your career, or do you have to renew it? Oh, it's good. Okay. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Once you, if you don't want to change your certification, well, first of all, the state exam you never have to retake. So, like, say you go to another state and then come back to Wisconsin, it's not like it. Um... Uh, well, that's another story. If you go, if you come back to Wisconsin and it was more than five years, if you've let your licensure lapse then you're going to have to reapply. You can be licensed in more than one state. If you're going away and you think you're coming back, you might want to consider keeping your certification here so you don't have to deal with it when you come back. Okay. Yeah. I think that was kind of my question because what if you're not sure if you want to stay here or if you're going to another state, but you want to you know, take the national, so should you take the test here and then in the other state as well? Every state has different certification or licensure requirements. If you know you're going to another state, you should contact that state. If you're an NSW member, and have you contact the NSW office in that state. If you're not, then tr contact the regulatory department if you can get through. Um, but every state is, handles it, it differently. But again, if you're 
going away and you think you want, you think you're a decent chance you're coming back, you know, why not do both? Then you're cool. You just have to keep up the continuing education. Yeah. So the continuing education is going towards your state. The continuing education is is going towards your certification or, or licensure in the in the state. In the state. Yeah. Every st most states require continuing education, so you could use it. Um, in another state too. So you could use it in two different states. Okay, so unless said, unless there's specific requirements in that state that's different than ours. I mean, there's yeah you know, a few states that say you've got to do four hours in, in this, but probably most of what you take here would be eligible so in another state. It says thirty hours every two-year credentialing period. Correct. And then it says four hours of professional boundaries and ethics. Yes. So is that a total of thirty-four? No. Or is that no. The 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 thirty hours of continuing education includes. Four, uh, must include four hours of social work boundaries and ethics. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. When can you join the NASW? In about Over. two minutes. Okay. 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 Anytime. Okay. Yeah, no, you can join anytime. Just go online and join. It's, and it says only $48 as a student, so it's a really good deal to join as a student because it's 25% of the rate, and then you have the, tra uh, the transition rate. And we give discounts on everything that we do. Yeah. Does it cost money to get the webinar to like the NASW webinar to train you to do the state or I can't remember. If yes, was. and we do. It's a you know discount for members, but there is a cost. Okay. Yeah. But we give a discount. And yeah. when is your session in Milwaukee? We haven't set the next one yet. We just had a session. We just we just had a session at our annual conference like a couple weeks ago. So we will be um, setting another date. Uh, I, I, we haven't set it yet, um, but I'm sure it'll be within the first quarter of 2015. The speakers already contacted me. I just we just have to get back to her and plan it. You can call our office or check our website. We'll have it posted. We just haven't done it yet, and I, I expect. We'll probably have that finalized before the end of this year, for 2015. Okay, last question. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. So if we graduate in May of 2015, mm -hmm. then essentially we won't have to have our 30 hours in until February 28th of 2019? Correct. Uh, that's Yes. You have to start thinking about it starting March 1 of 2017, but you won't need your 30 hours for 2019, February 28th, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, everybody.